Tells me I love my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been Of the goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of seated. Good morning. I'm going to read something to you. Church family, thank you so much for being sacrificial givers to Jesus Christ through the ministries of First Baptist Church. Visitors, you're not obligated to give. The only thing we ask from you is that you fill out the connection card that came in your bulletin. You can place that in the basket in the foyer. I'm Dan, and this is Jim, and Jim's going to pray now. Good morning. I want you to know it was absolutely beautiful out there. <clears throat> Excuse me, because I get here early and I leave late. I've never seen so many cars here. 
we're going to have to build some more parking lots. Thank you for all showing up. I just wanted, I want to pray, but I want to remind you, as I remind myself every morning when I wake up, and how lucky I am. And I start by looking at who's next to me, which is my wife. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and thinking all of my children. She's, she has brought these into the world, and I'm fortunate to <clears throat> experience them. So I'm just a reminder that we're in God's house today, and he much appreciates all of you here. And I just ask for each one of you to reach to him to help you through your day and your week. And I ask this every morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Worship your 
seated and uh, our youngsters are dismissed to a children's church along with those adults who would like to accompany them. Good morning. Our scripture today is Psalm 37, verses 1 through 9, and I'll give you a minute to turn to that. Today I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, Psalm 37. Do not be agitated by evildoers, do not envy those who do wrong, for they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. For evildoers will be destroyed, <clears throat> but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we heard your perfect word. We recognize as we sang that you are rich in love. Your heart is kind. God, we bless and thank you for loving us and allowing us to be here together today. Father, we pray over the conflict and war in Ukraine and with Russia. We ask that leaders in both countries would seek righteousness and justice. We ask that salvation would expand and that wars would cease. God, we pray over the many fires burning in our state and the firefighters fighting them. God, we ask for your protection for increased humidity, rain, and less wind. God, we recognize that you are the giver of all good things. And the greatest gift is you, as Jim prayed a moment ago. We thank you for the many blessings in our lives, but most of all, we recognize today that you are rich in love. Your heart is kind. We bless and thank you for being in our midst today. We pray that you would open our eyes and hearts to see you and hear from you. Now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, thank you, musicians and uh, prayers and everybody who's been a part of our service so far. And I agree with Jim. You guys do look good today. I don't know what it is, but you look good. We're glad that you're here today. Notice the very first verse of Psalm 37. If you have a Bible, you can open there. You can punch it in to your device if you'd rather do that. As long as you stay off social media, we're cool with it. Psalm 37, verse 1. Do not fret. Because of evildoers, be not envious toward wrongdoers. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, could the psalmist have written anything more applicable, more appropriate and helpful to you and me in 2022 than that first verse? 37.1 Don't fret because of evildoers. Anybody fretting right now because of evildoers? You felt that in your soul? Get this, the psalmist wrote that line more than 3,000 years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let Psalm 37 today be balm and medicine to your soul 
if you and I will heed these words. How amazing is God that He put this very thing that we've been dealing with in our society right here in the psalm. So welcome to church. We're glad you're here. If you joined us for the first time uh, last week during Holy Week, uh, you're in the right place. We're glad that you're back. If this is your first time, welcome to you. We would love for you to fill out that Connect card so we can connect with you. That's really all we, we care about. We don't ask anything else from you. But we are back in our series that we started prior to Holy Week. Psalms, our emotions, and His promises. Focusing on how we can know God and walk in a relationship with Him. If you're new to this Christianity thing, walking with Jesus, or uh, maybe you're just even thinking about becoming a Christian for the first time. If you feel like maybe in, in a third way, no one ever really discipled you. No one taught you how to follow Jesus. You don't feel like you were discipled. If any of those things is true for you, this series is for you. This week, as, as you're working out or going for a walk, you might want to go back if you haven't done it. And listen to this full series. It started on February 6th. February 6th, 2 6. You could go back on our YouTube channel or on Facebook and, and listen coming forward. Allow David to disciple you and how practically to have a relationship with God. David discipled us well if we'll listen to him. His words here are incredibly applicable for 2022. So notice here in Psalm 37, it would be helpful to read this psalm every night after you watch the news. You see that? Don't fret because of evildoers. What's on the news every night? Evildoers. Or if you're on social media, every day after you get off Facebook or your news feed, turn off the input of the world and turn on the Bible and go to Psalm 37. Don't fret because of evildoers. Evil seems everywhere around us sometimes, does it not? The amount of crime here in New Mexico. A murder every night, it seems like, in Albuquerque. Or the abuse of children. Or the injustice of the Ukrainian invasion, the violence and the murder. If it, you turn that over and over in your head. So notice first on your sermon notes, when evil seems to prevail, don't. When evil seems to be winning in whatever arena you might be looking, in your workplace or in global events or politics or in your family or even in your own soul, in your personal life, whatever it is, there are some actions and feelings that if you allow yourself to keep feeling them, to keep doing those actions, you will literally make the problem worse. One of the great dangers when entering an evil situation, catch this, is to become evil yourself. One of the greatest dangers when encountering evil is to become evil yourself. Evil is like quicksand. Satan wants nothing more than to get you pulled down into his trap. The more evil there is, the more it pulls you down with it. Evil is like pigs in the mud. It loves for you to get dirty too. But the amazing truth that the psalmist is inviting us to understand is that God can allow you to float above the evil. God knows how to combat evil. He understands it perfectly. He may call you to righteous deeds that would have some confrontation in them. You may have to take some difficult steps, but the only way, catch this, the only way to fight evil is to not get down in the mud with it. As soon as you do, you become, I become, a part of the problem. Fighting evil in an evil way is evil. Our culture needs to write that sentence down. Fighting evil in an evil way is evil. Or if you had really good parents, they taught you, two wrongs don't make a right. Most simply, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. A person is struggling in his marriage, and his spouse does something to hurt him. So he gets whatever sentence he can find that he knows will be the most hurtful sentence, will hurt her to her core, inflict maximum pain. And he turns it over in his mind, planning how he's going to hurt her because she hurt him. He feels justified in his action. She did something wrong to me. And then he waits for the perfect moment and he spews that sentence out in his anger. 
Well, guess what? Congratulations. Satan just had a major victory in your marriage. What was done to him might have been wrong, but he just made it much worse, that husband did. God is telling us this very simple message in this psalm. Two wrongs don't make a right. But then the Lord takes that simple truth and He's going to expand it and really help us know what should we do when we encounter evil. So look back at verse 1 with me, Psalm 37, 1. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards wrongdoers. So notice where the psalmist begins. He begins in the mind, on the inside. We have to get what's going on in here, in our brains, under control. And this psalm is going to tell us how to do it. Just look at the big numbers on your sermon notes. So the psalmist really gives us three categories of actions. The first one are don't do some things, don'ts. Second category are do, do some other things, do's. And most importantly, live into, based on the promises of God. This series is our emotions and His promises. This psalm is full of the promises of God. Of God. Walking in the gospel as a believer is all about walking in and living into what God has already done for us in Christ. Learning to receive and live into what He has done. So, notice the pattern with me. Back up in verse 1, there are don'ts. We just read them. Don't do these things. Now look at verse 2. For they, that is the evildoers, will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Do you see how that's a promise that is connected to the negative commands in verse 1? Don't fret. Don't be envious towards evildoers because, promise, they will wither quickly like the grass. Fade like the green herb. The natural grass in Israel is a lot taller than the natural grass that mostly we have in New Mexico. There are some places on the eastern plains that have grass like this. Grows up a foot or two feet, even taller, high. And then it dies as soon as the rain stops. More than 70% of the annual rainfall in Israel occurs between November and March during winter. Then the grass grows tall with all that moisture and then the rain stops and the grass is dead by summer. Uh, California has a very similar climate where the golden hills are golden because it's dead grass everywhere. Promise. Evil will fade like the grass. Now I want you to be honest with yourself. How would you deal with evil in this world? The evil that frustrates you if that is really true. If the evil people, the evil doers are going to fade, they're going to be done, they're going to be over quickly. It changes things, doesn't it? So let's finish seeing this pattern. We're just going to go really quickly through our verses. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. That's a positive command. Trust Him. Do it. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Command. Delight yourself in the Lord. Command. And He will give you the desires of your heart. Promise. That's promise connected to the commands. Commit your way to the Lord. Command. Trust in Him. Command. And He will do it. Promise. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. Promise. And your judgment as the new day. Promise. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Command. Do not fret because of him who carries, who prospers in his way. Notice this is the second usage of that. Do not fret because of evildoers. Because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. These are don'ts again. Negative commands. Verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Don't. Negative command. Do not fret. Don't. That's the third repeat of this negative command. To not fret. Definitely the theme here. Then look at the end of verse 8. It leads only to evil doing. Promise. For evildoers will be cut off, promise. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land, promise. As the psalm goes on, and it's wonderful, uh, but we're going to stop at nine, verse 9 because there are 40 verses, and I don't want you to be here until dinner time. So we see the commands, do certain things, don't do other things, all based on the promises of who God is and what He promises He will do, and also just facts of life. Evildoers will fade. Now let's go deeper. All right. When we encounter evil, we saw three times the psalmist say, do not fret about it. Don't worry. It's verse 1, verse 7, and verse 8. You see those? Don't fret. The Hebrew root of don't fret is the word hurrah. 
Hurrah. It's a verb. It's not a cheerleading verb. Hurrah. Get it? Um, hurrah. <laughs> uh, hurrah refers to, in Hebrew, how you make a fire. How you build a fire. Well, you need air. You need heat. And you need material. Flammable material. You have to start small, right? To build a fire. You start with kindling. Dry materials. You get those going with some heat and a little bit of air. And then you begin to add in medium-sized sticks, right? You have to build the fire. And well, you can't put big logs on. They'll squash it out. You have to add in more airflow. You have to let the heat build and get hotter. And then the fire begins to move fast. And you can, it can burn up bigger things. And it's a sustained burn. You can put the bigger logs on that will last Longer Now, fire in a a wood stove or a fireplace can be a great thing, light, heat, but that is not what the psalmist is talking about in this psalm. He's telling you and me how we need to be careful with our thought lives or we will burn our lives to the ground. That's what he's talking about. You got to be careful about what goes on in here or you will burn your life to the ground. Uh, A leading criminologist, Dr. Robert Agnew at Emory University, criminologist, studies criminal behavior. He says fear-based anger. Fear-based anger is the leading motive for violent crimes in our country. It's the fear, the worry, anxiety is little fear, the, the leading criminologist says can become the cause of the violent crimes, or it is the cause of the violent crimes around our world. See, God was way ahead of the PhD criminologist here in the Psalms. Take away the small tender, the frets, the envies, verse 1 says. Listen to Dr. Agnew's research. He says this, Extensive research has shown that certain emotions are highly associated with crime, particularly acts of violence. Some of the primal and instinctual emotions associated with violence are pride, jealousy, lust, and resentment. However, contemporary research reveals that the human emotion most likely to lead to violence is anger. Anger or rage is associated with a wide variety of violent acts, including homicide, aggravated assault, rape, domestic violence, child abuse, bullying, torture, and even terrorism. He's teaching us, you want to you make a difference in the world, you want to stop the big violent evils that we see on the television, you got to get small. And you got to deal with the fear and the anger and the anxiety. I was listening uh, last night to one of our uh, fire experts that's here in the state of New Mexico. He's talking about the Hermit's Peak Fire. He was a fire movement specialist. I thought, wow, that's a cool job. Fire movement specialist. He was talking about how a lot of people think when they see the big wildfires in our state that it's the big timber, the big trees that drive these massive fires. And he said that is not what keeps them moving and causes them to move so quickly. It's actually the pine needles that get dry on the forest floor and the dry grass on the ground. It is the tinder, the quickly burnable materials that when the fire is pushed with the wind, create this incredible speed and heat that then can burn that bigger material. It's all the small stuff, the tinder. See, fires always start small. That's what the use of the word hurrah, don't fret, in verses 1, 7, and 8, is telling us there's a process of building heat in your life that will cause you to burn your life to the ground. But if you can come in and stop the building process, get the small stuff out of the way, you can get the worries, the fears, the jealousies, the anxieties, the ways someone rubbed you wrong or even really hurt you, and you can stop dwelling on them and turning them over in your mind, feeding that fire of anger. Oh, I can't believe blank person did blank to me. You've never dwelt on how you've been wronged, have you? Um, I have. <laughs> person on the road cuts you off. 
and you give them gentle instructions about how to drive better. (laughs) Or someone slights you in life, you can't get it out of your head, can you? It's this little slight, this little, they weren't sensitive to you. They didn't think about you. They did something that you interpreted as them doing you wrong. And it's like a CD on repeat in your mind. And you can't turn it off. This is telling you, you can. And indeed, you must learn how. Noticing that you're becoming hot, noticing that you're playing that record over in your mind is really one of the first steps to get you moving in the right direction, to notice you are becoming angry. Narcissistic people often are incapable of even knowing they're becoming angry. They are, they are completely out of touch with who they are and their own emotions. We have to be able to identify it. Doctors can identify it. They can, they can watch your blood pressure go up. They can watch your, your pulse and your heart rate go up. Your muscles tighten. Blood rushing to your head and your neck as you build that fire of anger in your soul. So how do you take away... How do you stop the fire from getting bigger? Look at at verse 8. It's talking about the same process. 37.8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. That's again uh, from there in verse 1. It's one of the repeats. And then look at the end of verse 8. It leads only to evil doing. The psalmist says, don't stew in your anger, turning it over again and again, obsessively not letting it go, and especially don't plan wrath. It says, forsake wrath. Stop it. If you right now are here listening to me or you're online and and you are planning how you're going to hurt someone, and maybe for you it's just this little fantasy that you indulge sometimes, you haven't really been serious about it, but listen. Listen. God has read your story. He knows who you are. And He is telling you today and me, stop it. Forsake wrath. You're going to ruin your life. You're going to become just as evil as the evil that has so frustrated you. Notice the end of that last phrase, verse 8. It leads only to evil doing. Both Verses 8 and 9 mention evil doing, and they are connecting to the evil doers that cause us harm in verse 1. They're saying we have to prevent us becoming those same evil doers. The person who is fretting about how someone gossip behind her back can become evil herself as she continues worrying and fretting about whatever was said about her, and that little tinder in her mind causes a wildfire to rage in her soul. If you're not careful, evil just will pull you down into the mud and get you just as dirty as the people that you look at and say, wow, aren't they dirty? On August 3rd, 1996, Melvin Hitchens in the the late 90s sat on his front porch reading the Bible. A 66-year-old New Orleans resident after he finished his reading, put his Bible down, went in the house, retrieved a 45 caliber handgun. He went back outside and shot his neighbors. He killed Donna Jett as she swept her sidewalk and injured her husband, Daryl Jett, while he was mowing his lawn. The Houston Chronicle interviewed family members and neighborhood residents that testified the Hitchens family and the Jets family had a running feud, get this, over the care of their yards. And the Jets were taking care of their yard when they were shot. See, we can be thankful we don't have yards in Santa Fe, can't we? (laughs) How, How is that even possible? Murder someone and shoot someone else over the yard? To let something so small become a massive center of pain, tragedy, and evil? The yard? I like my rocks better today. Well, according to criminologist Dr. Robert Agnew, who I mentioned a minute ago at Emory, that is exactly how most violent crimes happen. The person had been stewing over something small. 
letting the little become bigger and bigger in the mind until they lose it and explode. It really wasn't the 30 seconds of violence that did them in. It was all the tender and the small sticks, the anger, the worry, the fear that made them a powder keg. Friends, we have to be careful what we put in here. And catch this, a great portion of our society is right now stewing in anger, worry, and fear 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. They call it the culture of outrage. In America right now. Tim Kreider is a p- political cartoonist and an op-ed writer who retired because of exactly this. I, I tried to look at his life and the best I can tell, I don't think he's a Christian. I don't necessarily agree with his politics, but he said this and I thought it was fascinating. He, he was a cartoonist for politics. And he said for eight years working in politics, he said, I spent every day mad. And he said he just noticed how unhealthy that was. And he said, I had to retire. I had to get out. And he said, I wasn't alone. So many letters to the editor and comments from the Internet have this tone of thrilled vindication. Thrilled vindication. What he's saying is we're angry and we like being thrilled at my vindication, my sense of justice. He's saying our culture is full of, and this is a quote, people who have been vigilantly on the lookout for something to be offended by, and they found it. He says, obviously, some part of us inside loves feeling, number one, right, and number two, wronged. But outrage is like a lot of other things that feel good, but over time it devours us from the inside out. He says, except it's even more insidious than most devices because we don't even consciously acknowledge that it is a certain kind of pleasure. We like being mad. And that's a person who is just a political cartoonist. I don't think even a Christian. And he saw how toxic this is becoming. There's an insider saying, if you listen well to our society of outrage, it's talking angry, worry, and fear 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And notice verse 8. The Bible says that leads only to evil doing. That culture of outrage will lead us to evil doing. So what do we do when we encounter evil? Well, we, first of all, don't become evil. We have to take control of our thought lives and remove that worry, envy, and anger. But man, if you've ever tried to not think about something, what do you do? You just keep thinking about it more and more, don't you? So notice second, the psalmist teaches us what to put into our minds instead of those small things. We have to replace the thought. Second, do trust in the Lord. Do good. Cultivate faithfulness, delight in the Lord, commit to the Lord, rest in the Lord, and wait for the Lord. Notice all those good verbs under number two in your sermon notes. Those all come right out of the text. These are the things that we are called to do. There are seven positive commands just in our nine verses, and only two of them are things that your hands and your feet can do. Do good and cultivate faithfulness, but those both start in the mind too. All of the rest of these positive commands are in the battle of the mind. Trust God, delight in God, commit to God, rest in Him, wait for Him. I want to talk to the the Christians among us. If you still haven't figured out how to have a consistent, quiet time, notice as we go through these Psalms, there is no way around the need for us to be in the Word of God and in prayer for our growth in knowing the Lord. There's no way around it. These are gospel-oriented actions the psalm is calling us to do, actions that we are commanded to do, but they aren't actions of the hands and feet. They are actions of the heart and the mind, actions of faith. Trust God. Delight in God. Wait for Him. Those might seem like little to-dos. Often I think we think about that. Well, I know I should have my quiet time. I know I should read the Word. I know I should pray to hear us shooting and all of that kind of stuff. I know I should do those things, but they're, they're kind of little and I don't have time for it. Or, or Bible study, I know I should do these things corporately or come to church, but I don't have time for those little things. 
Remember how, under point one, the tender that drives us towards explosive anger are also little things. They're the little things of envy, worry, anxiety. Well, notice here how the life of faith is also a life of putting positive little things into action. Just like not fretting seems like a little evil to avoid, a little don't, but it's the life of faith and a a little bit of faith, a mustard seed produces big things from God. The gospel is that Jesus Christ substituted himself on the cross to pay for the moral evils inside of our heart, sin. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus opened a life-giving relationship up for anybody who had put their faith and trust in Christ, accept Him as their Lord and Savior, and, and follow Him in a discipleship relationship. The good news of that gospel is that anger, envy, murder, rage, these are exactly what Christ came to deal with, moral evil in the human soul. I want to say to you, if you're not a Christian, there is great news. The Bible teaches you that if you will put your faith and trust in God, you begin a relationship with Him where He will come into your life and start dealing with those things. How do you put out the fire? It's a lot easier if you let the best firemen work on it. If you let God into your soul and let Him begin to transform you from the inside out. The Bible teaches that if we admit our sin to God, believe on Christ to save us, and confess Jesus as Lord, boss and king, He will give us this new life-giving relationship that will replace, as we seek Him, all of those negative, tender, fire-creating things in our soul. Look at the end of the psalm. We won't... Go over all the rest of the verses in Psalm 37. But look at 39. Psalm 37, 39. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. Who's the great big fireman you need for your soul? It is our God. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. So you look at evil. What do you need? You need God to fight that battle. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. For the person who becomes a Christian, the ability to deal with anger accelerates at the speed of the power of God because He is in our life now and He is the answer to the anxiety of our soul. Of course, we talk here that sometimes we need Medical help, too, to deal with anxiety. That is, of course, important. We're going to talk about that more next week. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, begins a transformation work in our soul when we come to know Him. Listen to how Paul speaks about the gospel in Philippians 1. He says, I'm thankful for you, Philippians, because of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. They have received it. They are believing it. Then he says this, 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And if you've got somebody in your life that they are just consumed with anger, don't try to just modify their behaviors. Pray that God will come into their soul because he will change them from the inside out. Look at how uh, this, I'm confident that God who began a good work in you perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Look at how that sounds very much uh, like verse 6, 37, 6. God will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. If you trust in the Lord, He will transform your heart. The good news for the Christian is that God Himself will not allow you to stay angry. He will not allow you to stay anxious. We're going to talk next week about how anxiety can be like a flashing light on the dashboard of your car. It tells you some things about what's going on in your soul, and it's helpful if you will let it be helpful. I always say Christians still know how to sin, but they can't enjoy sin anymore the way they used to. Sin begins to eat at our hearts. 
And God in His goodness begins to show us, hey, you're angry, man. Friend, for lady, you, you are stewing in rage and resentment. God won't let you stay there. He'll gently keep nudging you about it. you got to deal with this. Maybe right now as we study this psalm, the Lord is showing you you're angry. There's good news in here for you. He loves you. He has the power to change your life and your heart. Gospel counselor and pastor Paul Tripp says this, think of how little your anger in the last couple of months had anything at all to do with the kingdom of God. You're generally angry because things are in the way of God, not because you're generally not angry because things are in the way of God and His kingdom purposes. You're generally angry because something is in the way of your purposes. Something has gotten in the way of something you crave, something you think you need, something you think will inspire contentment, satisfaction, and happiness, but the truth is only God can make us content. Only God can satisfy. When we crave and delight most in Him, our soul is satisfied and put to rest. That's what God is trying to teach us here. Look at Psalm 37, 4. I love this verse. It's so worth memorizing. It's one of the ones I memorized as a young disciple of Jesus. But if you memorize it, memorize the whole verse. There are two parts. The verse is not, God will give you the desires of your heart. I have heard that said, I have heard that preached. That is not the verse. God will give you the desires of your heart. Look with me at 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Do you see how part A and part B are connected? Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of our heart. When we are delighting in God, He will give us Himself. It's what that verse is saying. It's what it means for the person that feels like, oh, that's a letdown. I thought God was going to give me everything I wanted in life. Listen, God is not the vending machine in the sky whose job it is to pop out your bag of Doritos whenever you're ready and you need a salty snack. God is the God of the universe. He is the treasure. He is what our soul really craves. Jesus teaches us similarly in John 15. He teaches us to abide in God. That God has the abundant life we crave and then we only get that when we're connected to Him as a branch is connected in to the vine. Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. How do you bear fruit of the Spirit? By spending time with God, with the Spirit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about that for Christian ministry or in our work lives or in our family, we're trying to get things better. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. We've got to become honest that the real problem that we see on the nightly news and the real problem that we see in our soul and in our marriage or family, if it's unhealthy, the real problem is called sin. The remedy for sin is Jesus Christ. When we encounter evil in school or what we see in Ukraine or in a marriage, when we see the pain of murder and violence, the problem in all of that is saying, God, we don't want you and your ways. We want our own ways. We're going to do it better ourselves or I'm going to do it better myself. I'm smarter than you, God. That prideful heart of sin. But the angrier you are, the more that you choose to stew on how you've been hurt, the less able to share who God is you will be. The less loving you are, the more angry you are, the less people will want to hear the life-changing message about Christ that you have. And guess what? The more and the more secular our society will become, the more and the more angry our society will become. Where does a change in an angry world begin? It begins in my heart and in your heart to seek the Lord instead of indulging those anger fantasies. 
Remember our method for sharing Christ in Santa Fe. Prayer, care, share together regularly. Pray, share the gospel, care for people, and do those things together regularly. Notice these commands under number two on your sermon notes. Notice how they're very similar to that. Trust in the Lord. Talk to Him about the evil. Pray. That will help your worries to go away, but you have to talk to Him. I can't do that for you. You have to pray. Do good. Love people. Serve them. Care. Prayer. Care. Care for people. Cultivate faithfulness. It's a farming term. Plant seeds of the gospel. Love people. Water those seeds. Do the farming work of the gospel that Jesus teaches us of evangelism. Prayer, care, share together regularly. Some people take years of faithful seed planting and watering and being loved before they're ready to receive Christ. But what is our hope to change the world? Our hope is to let God change the world when He meets people. And that's the part of the mission that He gave us, to share who He is with a hurting world. Boy, you want to talk about the power to change somebody. It's pretty amazing when you don't do anything, but the Holy Spirit is now inside of them. And you start looking at their life and just noticing, my goodness, what has happened to Bob? What has happened to Jim? What has happened to Susie? Something is different. It's amazing. I want to tell you, let me say wait on the Lord, the rest in the Lord, wait on the Lord, those last commands are in number two. Farmers have to be good waiters, have to be patient. They have to keep doing that process of farming, keep tilling, keep planting, keep watering, and then they begin to see big harvest, a big change. So throughout the history of the world, that's how God has changed societies through people that became convicted of their need to pray, of their need to repent and obey God in love and evangelism. I want to tell you, you will pass 90% of Christians in maturity if you will do the actions under number two. I talk to Christians all the time, and by and large, Christians are not having their quiet times They're not reading the Bible. They're not going to a Bible study. They're they're not praying really. They're not having an intentional prayer life. They're not regularly attending and serving a church. But that's how we receive the life of God into our spirit. That's how we abide in Jesus individually and corporately is by doing those spiritual disciplines. But Christians aren't doing this. Many that I talk to anyways. And they are weak and anemic when it comes to fighting evil. Instead of fighting evil, Christians on both sides of the aisle are being pulled down into the mud of our outrage culture that is just a forest fire of anger right now in our society. Those outraged with evil are becoming evil. Verse 8. Verse 8 is a summary of what's happening in America right now. I want to read verses 3 through 9 again, and I want to read it as an invitation from the Lord to each of us today. Listen. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to Him. Trust in Him, and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing, for evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Friend, does that not sound like a better way to live? The way it does to me, it sounds like a wonderful invitation. Rest in the Lord. Let Him fight your battles. What's stopping you today? Don't let worry, fear, or anger lead you to become evil yourself. Don't let the evil on the outside drive you to evil on the inside. Do spend time with God and see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And finally, the psalmist is inviting us to live based on the promises of God. So far, this whole sermon, I haven't said anything about 
well, is somebody going to fight the evil? Is somebody going to do something? This is where the teeth of this psalm come in. This isn't letting the evildoers off the hook, not even a little bit. Notice under number three, the promises here. Evildoers will fade, verse two. God will give you the desires of your heart, those who delight in him. He will act, verse five. He will excel your righteousness. Those who trust in him, even though that's little, he will speed up. He will do the work in your soul. He will bring forth judgment, verse six. You know, oftentimes when people talk about why we're called to forgiveness, they really struggle in their soul. They can't let go of the ways that they've been wrong. They can't forgive. Do you know how the Christian can have ultimate peace that forgiveness is right when there is evil in the world? Because God promises He will bring forth judgment against all evil. There is not one evil action that escapes the eyes of God, not one, or the judgment of God. God cares so much about the pain and suffering in this world that He leveled His wrath against His only Son to forgive those who would come to God asking for that forgiveness. But the rest of the world will then have to face that wrath of God themselves on Judgment Day. Those who do not have the forgiveness of Jesus are still in their sins, the Bible says, and God will give them what their deeds have earned. Evildoers will be cut off, verse 9. But those who wait on the Lord will inherit the land. The land refers to Jerusalem and Israel, but for Christians in the New Testament, uh, it refers to the dwelling place of God, our inheritance in heaven. When eternity is our real hope, we become able to deal with evil in this magnificent way. We let God fight that battle. And get this, He's a lot better at fighting your battles than you are. He is able to fight them perfectly. He never gets muddy. He never gets drawn down into the quicksand. When we let the little things, the worries, the frets, the envies, the angers have a constant voice in our soul, we are in danger of burning our lives to the ground. But the still, small, quiet voice of God today is offering us another way. Pastor writer Philip Yancey writes of a friend whose marriage was choked by hostility. And one night this friend told Philip Yancey that he just reached a breaking point and he screamed at his wife, I hate you. I won't take it anymore. I've had enough. I won't go on. I won't let it happen. No, no, no. He reported he screamed at her. They stayed together, but months later, he woke up in the middle of the night to see sounds coming from his son's room. His son was two years old. He walked down the hall and stopped outside of his son's door. And he said what he heard there just sent shivers down his spine, took away his breath. Inside that room, the two-year-old was repeating in a soft voice, but with precisely the same inflection and intonation in his voice, what he had heard his dad say months before. I hate you. I won't take it anymore. I've had enough. I won't go on. The two-year-old was exclaiming, Softly. Church, may we not allow the evil on the outside, and it is there, but we, may we not allow it to get in on the inside, to create the same evil from within that we were so frustrated by. May we not allow the evil to pull us down into its mud. But instead, may we allow the perfect voice of our Heavenly Father be the words that we repeat and the inflections of heart that we learn to say. Don't fret because of evildoers. Delight myself in the Lord and He will give me the desires of my heart. Rest in the Lord. Read. Wait patiently for Him. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Don't fret. It leads only to evil doing and evil doers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. May that be us, friends. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank You for this amazing Word in Psalm 37 that is old and yet perfectly new. God, You understand humanity. You understand our soul better than anyone. And we come to You right now as Your church family asking You to help us, God. We pray for our own souls. Lord, would you right now begin a process of transformation if we've not been open to that in the past? I want to invite you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. The band's going to begin to play, and this is our just time of reflection. This is your time and my time to meet with the Lord and and to really respond to what He says in His Word. And I want to ask you, how are you doing in the culture of outrage? Have you become outraged? I want to be honest with you. It's everywhere. I have to fight this. it's, It's insidious. Evil is so good at pulling us down into it. The invitation today, if you've never met Jesus is to invite Him into your soul to begin to transform you. The Bible says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Next verse says, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. If you've never believed on Jesus to save you, I want to invite you to do that right now. The way you do it here, we just we try to make it simple. We just say A, B, C. Admit A, admit your sin to God. B, believe on Christ to save you. And C, confess Jesus as your Lord, your, your new boss, your king. Admit your sin, believe on Christ to save, and confess Jesus as your Lord. Let him begin to bring a transformation to your soul that's more powerful than you trying to do it yourself. And I want to talk to all of the Christians in the room, and I'm talking to myself this morning. Do we need to recommit to abiding in Christ? To personally and corporately with Bible studies and in church, allowing Him to prevent our souls from becoming the very evil that we despise. Christian, would you commit to allowing the voice of God into your life in prayer and Bible study to help with your anxiety, to help with your fear, to bring forgiveness where you feel offended. However Christ is calling you as the band plays, respond to Him as our musicians lead us. Let me know if I can help you in any of those next steps. God bless you. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we pray. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. one we
healing and praise our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for you are the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts always hunger You may be seated. If you would, for just a few moments, take out your worship bulletin. want to let you know about a few things happening in the life of our church. Uh, right after church today, uh, our youth are having a bake sale to support uh, camp scholarships. This is the only fundraiser we do at FBC throughout the year. 100% of any donations you make go right to scholarships for to send kids to camp. And we do have kids that need those scholarships. We have several uh, people that aren't Christians that want to go with us to youth camp and hear the gospel. How cool is that? Uh, but some of them do need some help uh, to make sure that they get there. Uh, if you are uh, gluten-free, um, there may not be anything out there for you. I think it's out. Uh, but, but you can give donations anyways. It's mostly carbs and gluten, I think. Um, uh, maybe they have something out there for you. I don't know. Um, but we'd love for you to participate at, in that and be a part of our youth camp bake sale. Uh, second, this Thursday, our women's ministry has their once a month uh, women's ministry night. Make sure and plug that into your phone, ladies. It, they have really been learning in the book of Daniel. You want to talk about a book that is relevant to living in a secular society. Daniel is amazing. Uh, third, uh, this coming Saturday, our homeless shelter luncheon is happening. And uh, Susan and Connie uh, Bailey need some folks to help uh, prepare and serve lunch on Saturday, would you uh, call them? Their numbers are right there on the, the purple homeless shelter lunch. They would love for you to be a part of that. That is so important for us to serve the needy in our community, and I'm so thankful for our homeless team that helps us as a church family to do that. So if you want to do that, uh, contact Connie or Susan. That's this coming Saturday. And finally, in the foyer, we've got several things going on that you can sign up for. Our uh, Tinian uh, Baptist Church Outreach Concert is uh, a I think two weeks from Sunday. It's on May 1st, and they're going to go out to, is that a week from Sunday? This coming Sunday. Okay, week from today. Thank you, Karen. Um, so uh, they would love for you to come if you want to help with that outreach concert. It's a great way for uh, the Navajo to reach their friends. And then in the same way, we'll be this coming Saturday uh, having a concert here in our sanctuary. We would love for you to be a part of that. You heard uh, Solveig at the very beginning of church. Uh, what a beautiful voice. Uh, Karen Lafferty asked her to come. I think she kind of looks like Karen Lafferty a little bit. So I see why, I see why you like her so much. Um, but man, thank you for setting that up. I don't know if you heard her singing. It's hard to pronounce her name, but she was singing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a beautiful song. I'm excited to hear that this Saturday in our church. Uh, if you uh, uh, only have yourself that's going to be coming to the concert, uh, buy yourself a ticket outside in the foyer. They're cheaper to buy them in advance. But we would love for you to buy about 20 and give them out to your neighbors for free. Let them come hear that beautiful voice uh, sing about Jesus. Uh, so make sure and invite uh, your neighbors as well. You can sign up out in the foyer to uh, be a part of Vacation Bible School. We need all hands on deck for that coming up in June. And there's several other things out there that we invite you to be a part of. Church, thanks so much for being here today. We do have some new members who've come to join our church family today. First is the Gardner family. Would you guys stand up back there? Uh, it's uh, Dad Dave and Mom Nina. And then the kids are Charlotte, Gabby, and Will. We love you guys. I know you'll join the pastor in, to, in saying to those who come to join our church family today, welcome to the family. We love you guys. Dave and Nina both have received Christ, and uh, we're praying that for their kids for the day that they'll be baptized, so join us in praying for those kids. As well, today we have Trudy Robbins, who's come to join our church family. Trudy's right over here. Welcome, Trudy. 
Trudy is transferring her uh, membership from First Baptist Raton, New Mexico, and we're so glad that you're a part of the family as well. Would you join me in saying to Trudy, welcome to the family. We love you guys, and we're glad you're a part. Stand up. We'll have our closing prayer, and you can go get some of those amazing goodies out there and pay way extravagantly for them. Let's pray, church. God, in Jeremiah... Your word says, the heart is desperately sick. Who can understand it? You, O oh Lord, understand the heart and you test the mind. God, teach us to deal with our soul. We ask that you would remove the anxiety, the fear, the worry, the anger. Let us be people full of your peace and your joy as we seek your son Jesus in our lives. It's in his name we pray and ask that you would help us abide. Amen. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.